of the nation. There is no part of the nation you will not find there. North, south, east, and west. I bring greetings from my family, from my wife. She is not able to be here with us today because she is uh, taking care of a small church that God is nurturing through us, even as I left. But I was there this morning and before I got here. And finally, I also want to commiserate with the church family for all the passages that have taken place uh, in recent times. For us to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the truth. Uh, even though this is part of the most difficult things that a pastor has to grapple with. And so I commiserate with the church family and I just say that we should live ready. Don't get ready. Live ready. Praise the Lord. The theme that I may know, that I may win some, that I may win some, from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22. My message is titled, By All Means. So that I may win some by all means. Can you say it with me? That I may win some by all means. It's all in the same verse. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23. Although you want the background, you start earlier on. But let me just read the two verses. I need to move very fast in order to keep pace with time. To the weak became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Praise the Lord. 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, if you look at the title of my message, by all means, whenever you are talking about means, you are talking about strategy. Strategy. So that's the focus. Strategy. But when you consider the text closely, there are a few things that will come to mind. Verse 22. It says, to the weak became I, or if you, if you backtrack a little bit to verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel... I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I may gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I may gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I may gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. 
I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Praise the name of the Lord. So looking at the test, a few things drop to mind which we will try to um, put together in that focus of strategy. Strategy, by all means, using all strategies. The first thing that comes to mind when you look at the text 22 and 23 is that one, the priority of every Christian, the priority of every Christian life is to win souls. Jesus emphasized this when he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me and I will make you a rich man. He didn't say, follow me and I will make you one thing or the other that most people want to be or to become. But he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So the supreme priority of every Christian life is to win souls. To win souls. And that underscores the focus that we must win souls by all strategies. The reason is because when you look at the scriptures, you will see the passion of Christ for soul winning. He knew his mandate. He knew that he was born to die. He knew that though he knew no sin, he was to become sin so that all sinners might become partakers of the righteousness of God in Christ. He knew that. So he was so passionate. He knew he was going to die a gruesome death. He knew he was going to be accused of what he did not do. He knew that he was going to be put in a kangaroo court and to be crucified. Yet he set his face to Jerusalem as a flint and he went there to die. We must catch that passion. That whatsoever we do, whether you're a businessman, you're a businessman to win souls. Whether you're a worker in the office, that is your put pulpit. That is your platform to win souls. You are a driver driving your bus from morning to evening. That is your platform to win souls. The priority is driven by the passion. And the reason is simple. It is because that is also the master's passion. It is because he has commissioned every one of his followers to do the same. He said, as my father has sent me, so send I you. It is because the value of a soul is of highest worth on planet earth. There is nothing that can be compared with the value of one soul. Jesus prefaced that when he said, what can, what can you gain? What can, what, what can it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? So when you balance, you put on a scale, the value of all the real estate on planet Earth on one side and put one soul on the other side. The value of a soul, the weight of a soul will tilt far beyond the value of the real estate of the whole earth. That is why it must also be our supreme priority. That is why we must use everything that we do in life as a platform to win souls. That is why we must be on the lookout for every opportunity. That is why we must devise every strategy. But you see, the strategy must be such that you must be anchored on Christ, but geared to the time, to the times. 
what we are doing here today or this month probably will be considered something that cannot be done in church 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But the times are different. The anchor is what keeps us rooted in Christ. The anchor is, to, is, is, is the realization that we are commissioned to win souls. The anchor is that that is the master's passion. The anchor is that Jesus Christ is expecting every one of us to be like him. For that he invested his spirit in order to, to give us the capacity to do the same. So wherever we go, we must win souls. In whatever condition, come rain or shine, we must win souls. The condition of the economy should not dampen our spirit to win souls. Whether you are able to eat one round meal or three square meals, none of that is an excuse. We must win souls. That's a priority. And it's a priority for you, the priority for me. It was a priority for Jesus. It's a priority for every Christian. So long as you live a Christocentric life, you live a Christ-centered life. That's why Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. And Apostle Paul made a similar statement. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's a primary objective for every one of us. And we must understand and be driven by the fact that as much as one soul is so highly valued in God's account, any lost soul will be lost forever in hell for all eternity. And possibly that soul was lost because we did not do something about it. Because I did not do something about it. Because you did not do something about it. Because we did not examine the strategy that can bring that soul to Christ. Every soul we reach. If you look at the scriptures I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 16. Every soul we reach is a potential saint. Is a potential believer. Is a potential Christian. Every soul, no matter the tribe, no matter the gender, no matter the age, every soul is a potential Christian. We must approach them in the same way. We must approach them with compassion, with a heart that is driven by the understanding that if you don't do something, this one may end in hell for all eternity. Many of us do not have a correct perspective of eternity. Time without end is a continuum that does not have day and night. It's a continuum that we do not have a measure for it on this side of eternity. Because we are, we are conditioned with day and night. We are conditioned by day and night. So we find it difficult to comprehend what eternity looks like. And in all eternity, they'll be in agony. They'll be in suffering. In continuous punishment. Away from God. 
the source of life. I want you to just imagine to be without oxygen for one minute. Let somebody just grab you, either by the throat or by the nose, and try to force you not to take in oxygen for one minute. I'm not talking about three minutes, I'm not talking about four minutes, just one minute. Because God has designed us to live by taking in oxygen and bringing out carbon dioxide. So when we are cut off from oxygen, we can't breathe. Physical life is terminated. Now, you can imagine someone disconnected from his maker for all eternity. You can imagine the agony you will feel just trying to breathe for one minute. Then extrapolate that to one year. Yet the person will be with understanding. To 100 years, to 1,000 years, the person will still be with understanding and with feeling. Can't die physically anymore. Brethren, if you look at that scripture again, in verses 23, 22 and 23, you will discover that not only that our priority must, must be to win souls and also that every soul must be regarded as a potential Christian, but also that we need to adopt every strategy. He said to the Jew, I became a Jew. To the one under the law, I became as a man under the law. To the one without the law, I became as a man without the law. Apostle Paul had this wonderful understanding I want to pass across to us today. That was why we, when he got to Athens, the people who had no cultural connection with the commonwealth of Israel, and I'm sure he was wondering, how can I bring the gospel to these people? And looking around, he said he saw that everywhere by their superstition, they had all manner of temples and altars. And then he observed them very carefully until he found one where they put an altar to the unknown God. He said, hey, now I've come to show you that God which you do not know, but you are reaching out to. It's not like the one that you put this kind of altars for. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to ventilate our hearts, to show us strategies, ways and means. And I want to thank God for culture, for evangelism. But let's also remember that we must have our anchor on Christ as we are geared to the times. When we look at this strategy, we ask ourselves, which strategies are effective? Jesus already has put it down. When he said in that Matthew chapter 8, He used the analogy of fishing. Fishing. We can't reinvent the wheel. Jesus had put it down. All we need to do is to sit down and study it very well. Fishing. I'm from an island, although today a road has been built to Opobo. It took 21 years to build. Uh, don't clap. Don't clap, please. Behind my father's house, there's an oil well. And I'm sure that that, the oil that they took from there, they used it to build roads elsewhere. All over the nation. And it took 21 years to build a road to Pobo. But thank God it has happened. Thank God all the same.
I, like I said, I come from an island. Okobo is an island. Just, and it's going to be like that for some time. Not many of us realize that the Jora is an island, originally. But today, you can't see the island anymore because it's connected everywhere by roads. Thank God. That is what advancement brings, infrastructure to make movement easy. The strategy with the analogy of fishing is very instructive. There are two major types of fishing, which we know, major types. The one where the individual, I'm talking about artisanal fishing, the one, not industrial fishing, the one that an individual will carry a net and will cast it. And then it will drag the school of fish. Or the one that you go with a line and hook and a bait and drop there. Jesus was conversant with both. You remember when he told Peter, when they came to harass them, to pay tax? He said, please, uh, I know you're a fisherman. Go back to the shore there, but take a line. Drop it there. The fish you get, open the belly. You will get a silver coin. Use it to pay your tax on our own. So Jesus was very conversant with that. In Luke 5, he borrowed the boat of Peter. Peter was in the company, fishing company, with James and John. And they had cast nets all night. So two major types of fishing. But today, I want us to concentrate because I'm speaking to individuals. You see, the one you cast the net can be likened to crusades, outreaches, mass evangelism. But I'm talking about the one that we must put as a priority, personal evangelism, personal soul winning. The church must encourage it. The church must turn every one of us to become evangelists every day in season and out of season. And what's the strategy there? We can see something from what Jesus said. If you examine the fishing with a line, the first thing that comes up is that in order for you to catch fish, whether by net or by line. You go where the fish is or where the fish are. You go to where the fish are. And that's why in the village, people will paddle their boats, their canoes, and they will go far away. They will go to the fishing grounds, the known fishing grounds. They know where fishes are. They know where fish spawns. They know where the fish finds food to eat. They know where they aggregate. And they also know the time. They, we need to go where the fish are. Hello, sir. The fish is not in the church. The fish is not in the church. If ever you find the fish in church, it is like the parable of a lost sheep where you leave the 99 that is safe and you go after one. But I reverse it. One is in the church. And 99 is out there. One is in the church. And 99 is out there. So all the things we do to invite people and bring them to church, I want to tell you today, it all comes, boils down to having one. Just one. The 99 is out. That's why Jesus said, go ye 
Today I ask you, are you a go ye Christian or a stay ye Christian? Go ye. Eight years ago, I was invited to go. I knew clearly what the implications were. Very clearly. But I also knew what God had told me ever before I was invited. I knew that he had prepared my heart. And this we are doing here today is to prepare your heart. To be willing to go. Go ye. Go to where the fish are. Number two. Go to where the fish are hungry. Apparently, Peter and Co., they, with all their expertise, they went to where the fish was. And they kept throwing their net. They didn't catch anything all night. What does that translate to us today? There are communities, there are places where you go, you discover that people are not ripe for, this, for the gospel. The more you go there and hit, the more you harden the heart of those people. But the more you pray out of a burden, Lord, show me where to go. You pray like Paul the Apostle. He wanted to go this way. The Holy Ghost said, don't go. He wanted to go this way. The Holy Ghost said, don't go. At night, after he had prayed almost all night and slept, he had a dream. Come over to Macedonia and help us. I pray you have that kind of a dream. So you go where the fish is hungry. We went to Ajegunle, and the first thing they asked us was, which kind of church are you? Are you like them that came here and took all our money with all the schemes, economic schemes, the pyramid schemes, and all the things that you want to you that you, they promised us will make us wealthy? They gathered our money and disappeared. Are you like them? I said, no, we are four square. We belong to the International Church of the Four Square Gospels. Go and check. I got there. We are in Lagos. Where four square started in 1955. There were many, majority of the people had not heard the word four square. I've shared it with some. After the district was created, before we were commissioned, I went with my prayer partner, traversing every area that constituted the new district, asking one question. Please, where is Four Square? We didn't put church. Where is Four Square? Some of them asked me, is he like Mr. Biggs? So we knew what we were up for. We said we are here as members of this community. We are here to ensure that Christ is made known. We are here to ensure that you receive the benefit of his sacrifice, of his death. He died so that we will be free from all sin, so that we will not die the eternal death. We died not just to bring you money for gari and uh, soup or to make you wealthy. We are here to bring you Jesus Christ so that you'll be saved from your sin. Many people have gone ahead doing all sorts of things. When we relocated to our new site, after 14 months in the first site, in a rented place, just close to us there, somebody opened up a shop and called it church. Just one small room. He said, I've come here to do spiritual work. When you tell him your problem, he will analyze it and say, to do this work, you need to bring so and so amount of money. That's what the people there have suffered. And then he told one man, your own work is very serious. Please bring one million naira. The man brought one million naira. He said, you see this? It's powerful oil. You drink it. 
and all your problems will be gone. The man drank acid. Acid. And before he died, we were just able to write what happened because he couldn't talk again. By the time they went there, the man, of course, had packed up and uh, closed shop and disappeared. Let's go to where the fish are hungry. Let's use the right bait. Bait. In what we are doing currently here, music is the right bait. Very powerful. But then we also need to watch it. I saw a video. I don't know who sent me that video. I think they are trying, that church was also trying to do something like this. And they included masquerade. In that video, masquerade was dancing with the pastor on the altar. I said before, anchored on Christ, but geared to the times. If you have to go to where the fish are, you need to ask yourself, where are they today? Many are in the cyberspace. Many. And we need to know how to do church in the cyberspace. If you must get the young generation, the millennials, those who were born from year 2001 up till now. You know, they were born into GSM. They don't have any clue as to when Nigeria did not have a telephone. <laughs> Millennia. You cannot, you that were born before then, preconditioned with the time before that time. You cannot now use your own ideas, preconceived ideas, to reach that kind of person. Let's go to where the fish are. Let's use the right bait. Let's present the bait correctly. And then let's bring them in. Brethren, I want to round up by saying this. In Luke chapter 15, in very short scripture space, within 24 verses, Jesus had released three parables all about soul winning. The parable of the lost sheep I mentioned before. The parable of the lost coin and then the parable of the lost son or if you like prodigal son as we used to call it. Read those scriptures. you are a believer. Luke 15. From verse 4 to verse 24. Then you will contact the heart of God. The concern of God. Then that concern will drive you to make yourself to be disposed to God. For God to use. That concern will, be, will burden your heart to pray. To pray. And after you have prayed, by the grace of God, you'll be open to divine signals. And then you'll be ready to speak. And you speak the words that God puts in your mouth. Speak. I was riding in a public transport to Akwanga one day. And I was wondering, how do I present Christ? And then suddenly, we ran into hold up. And I, I said, eh, that's true. Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you. And Nahum, by the prophet, declared, in the day of preparation, the chariots shall rage on the streets. So ever before modern traffic came online, it had been prophesied 
that there will be hold up, there will be go slow, and it will happen in the day of preparation. The day that Jesus talked about, I go to prepare a place for you so that when I come, I will take you to be with me. And then I began to say, as surely as it was prophesied before Jesus came, as surely, surely Jesus also came, he is coming again. This is the time for you to prepare your heart to meet with him. This hold up we are passing through today, what people can identify with. That's what I believe culture of evangelism is. What people can identify with. What will make Christ known much more easily for everyone? There, proclaim Christ. Brethren, there are many believers today that are not leading Christocentric lives. And in the, da the danger in a church like this, a church that is 65 years old, is that if you don't reinvent yourself, that's the modern language, if you don't seek revival continuously, you may not even know when, when the Spirit of God has left you, he comes noisily, he goes away quietly. I'm talking to you about dangers. He comes, how? Noisily. And you blow tongues. But you begin to grieve him. You begin to quench him. You begin to live a self-life. And he leaves you quietly. And you rise up and say, I will do like before. And... Like that prophet that died in the hands of Philistines, he did not know that the Spirit of God had left. May that not be your portion in Jesus' name. I say that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Can we rise to pray? Can we rise to pray? There is much to be said, but there is very little time. So, what is left now, I want us to pray. The motive for all of this is that Christ will be proclaimed and that he will be glorified. That's the motive. And that is what should determine our strategy at all times. We must be open, ready to change our strategies. That is... The gear. The gear determines the speed of a vehicle. The speed of the ship, of the boat. The gear. It then sounds as if it is contradictory. Anchored. And then <laughs> with a gear. But it's very meaningful. The gear means that for you to be effective, for you to gain, gain traction and to be to, to, to move fast because the time is at hand. The time is little. Be ready to alter your strategies. Don't be cast in a stone. Don't become a monument. Four square is still a movement. But is four square moving and leaving you behind because you have become a monument? God forbid. I want you to pray. Lord, help me. I am still a follower of Christ. Lord, help me. I still desire to live a Christ-centered life, a life of obedience. The fulfillment of a gospel mandate is dependent on my obedience, your obedience, our obedience. Lord, give me grace to obey. When I hear go, I shall go. When I hear open my mouth and speak, I will speak. Lord, give me that grace. Oh, Lord, fill me with your spirit again that the passion of Christ, his heart, 
will contact my heart. That his heart will set my heart on fire for the, the lost souls. Can you pray with me now? Can you pray, Lord, set my spirit on fire for lost souls. They are everywhere. They are close to you. They are where you walk. They are where you live. Even when you are moving on the way. Many of us today do not go by public transport anymore. But you have your own car. Good, that's a blessing. Can you determine in your heart prayerfully to pick somebody? Give him a lift. Give her a lift. When you are going, wherever you are going. So that the 15 minutes, the 10 minutes, the person will be there. In fact, learn to minister the gospel with three minutes. Three minutes. Long enough time that it takes for the aircraft to crash. Three minutes. Three. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. In the name of Jesus. Help me, O oh God. I still belong in your gospel train. Lord, use me. Every obstacle, whatever stands in my way. Let me tell you the truth. We may start this kind of program very well. But before long, it may, be, it may turn to just mere entertainment if you are not careful. Lord, it's possible that I have gone astray. With your hand, bring me back, O oh Lord. Let me be on fire for you, O oh Lord. Let not that soul go to hell. If I can help it, let not go to hell if I can help it. Father, help me. And let me tell you, even when you, 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 witness and you are rejected don't bother yourself the best you can do is that you win some that i may win some that's the best that you may win some father help me to win some today as i live help me tomorrow every day oh lord may i not find rest may i not find sleep until I brought one soul back home to the master. I want to close by giving an opportunity to anyone who is here. You don't know Jesus Christ. You are still in your sin. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ died for you. He that knew no sin became sin. So that God will forgive you all your sin. Because of Jesus, God had mercy on you. Mercy on me. Many of us that are believers today become angry when wicked men and women get born again. We've forgotten that we are no different. The mercy of God is the same for everyone. He did not give you according to your works. And he has decided also not to give unto that person according to his or her works. Why are you angry? Like the, the brother of the prodigal son. Don't be angry. Let's pray for them. Now, I want you to pray. Everyone that is an instrument in the hand of the devil to, to bring trouble in my street, to bring mayhem in my neighborhood, in this nation, in this state, Father, I bring them before you now. Lord, I arrest them in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for their salvation. Father, that they may be born again, that they may come to an awareness to know that, look, it, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I want you to pray for God to reveal himself, the God of judgment unto the sinner, and the God of compassion to the one who is repentant. Lord, reveal yourself, oh God. It will make it easy for me to bring the gospel to them. Reveal yourself, especially to Muslims. These ones have a mandate to destroy Christianity and to destroy Christians. Pray for them. They have a mandate to destroy Christianity and to destroy Christians. Pray, Lord, reveal yourself to them. 
Reveal yourself more than I can speak. Give me grace, O oh Lord, to pray for them day and night. I make that call now. You are here. You are not born again. Please come. I want to pray with you. Anyone? You have not yet received Jesus into your heart as your Lord and personal Savior. My time is up. Please come. I want to pray with you. I also want to pray with anyone that says, okay, I want to go, but I, my knees are paining me. My muscle is aching. I don't think my heart can take it. I am feeling all bad. Wherever you are, you have any kind of sickness that is wearing you down. Just put your hand upon your chest, upon your head. I pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You made the provision for our healing. You said he himself took our infirmities and carried away our sicknesses. By his stripes, we are made whole. I therefore rebuke that spirit of infirmity. I curse you to your roots. Whatsoever my father has not planted, be uprooted. In the name of Jesus, every obstacle standing in your way, by way of sickness, I command, be healed. I said, be healed. I said, be healed. I said, be healed. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you glory and praise. Allow our God, let not your word which we have read and shared among ourselves stand to condemnation for any man, to any woman. I pray, Lord God, that it will transform our hearts. It will change our thinking. It will spot drive us to make plans and to take decisions for personal soul winning, to devise strategies, all manner, and be ready for any opportunity. As we go out from tomorrow, we'll look out for souls. We'll look out for opportunities. And as we open our mouths, the Lord will fill our mouths. And when you speak, your word will not fall to the ground. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, it is to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed.